Welcome everybody. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Rounds. I am Gayatri Jay Shankar. I'm one of the general pediatricians here with ETSU Pediatrics. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items before we start. Can I request everybody, and that includes medical students and residents, everybody to sign in using the number in the back of the room and put in the event ID. Now, that will also be for CME credit. If CME does not recognize your phone number, you will get a text asking you to identify yourself, and then you can get credit. For medical students and residents, even if you don't need the credit, we need you to sign in using that event ID because that's how they're counting numbers for attendance. And apparently CME needs to show the numbers as well as the next piece that I'm going to talk about as far as being able to continue these grand rounds. And so can I request everybody to please sign in using the number in the back of the room with the event ID. And if this is the first time you're doing this, you will get a text in the next week or so from CME asking you to identify your phone number, okay? Um, the second piece is, can I please, please, please request everybody to make sure and fill out an evaluation form at the end of the presentation. Um, CME says they can no longer continue grand rounds unless we turn in evaluations for them. Um, and so, can I please request everyone, and I'll come pass them around, make sure that you turn in your evaluations at the end of the presentation. This is also really helpful to the speaker, so please do that. Speaking of our speaker, I'm very excited to have Dr. Piyush Singh present on a very topical topic today, preparing for a measles outbreak. And I love that picture. <laughs> um, Dr. Singh came to us in 2012 um, as a resident in pediatrics. He is one of our graduating residents and is getting ready to go out and practice in Minnesota. Um, we are very excited for him, but we'll be sorry to see him go. We will really miss him because he has done a wonderful job while here with us in pediatrics, um, has been involved in the residency, has had numerous poster presentations. Prior to coming here, he did his medical schooling from Andhra Medical College in Vishakhapatnam in India, following which he also has a master's in public health from the University of North Texas. Um, he has also done some graduate work um, and has been a research assistant in the Department of Pediatric Pulmonology at UNC Chapel Hill. So he came with many strengths and has done an amazing job here. Um, I'm excited to listen to his presentation, Dr. Singh. Thank you. is not working, so let me know if you guys cannot hear me. <coughs> so that's, that's Mickey with uh, measles. It's, it's unfortunate that he got it, uh, because uh, even though I'm not a big fan of uh, Disney, but uh, I know most kids are. So, uh, but, but it's, it's good in one way because it's good in one way because it uh, gave measles so much media attention and it uh, reignited the uh, uh, vaccination debate. So I have nothing to disclose. So I, have, I, I personally have never seen a case of measles, and I was n never expecting to see a case of measles. And uh, but uh, because of a um, lot of people who do not vaccinate their kids, there has been a recent uh, comeback uh, for measles, and uh, it's it's good to be prepared and um, know everything about measles. So if we see a kid with measles, we are ready to take care of him. So talking about some history, this is a picture of um, a physician in the uh, ninth century. His name was Muhammad I Zakaria a Razi, uh, known as Razis or Razes. He was the uh, um, he actually uh, published a book um, and described the symptoms of uh, smallpox and measles, and his his book is very descriptive. He uh, described the prodrome and then um, the uh, classic rash that you see in measles. 
he's also a father of pediatrics and uh, was the uh, was the person who wrote the first manual of uh, pediatrics in 1757 a scottish physician named francis home he uh, took blood from uh, uh, infected patients and then uh, gave it uh, to healthy individuals not an ideal way to do research but uh, he found out that uh, measles was caused by an infectious agent in 1912 measles became a notifiable disease in united states so before before we had vaccine nearly all children got measles by the time they were 15 years of age. There were estimated 3 to 4 million people in U.S. Um, infected each year. And, um, and at, at, in that period, the reporting was not very good. So probably this is um, an underestimate of the actual number of cases. Approximately 4 to 500 people died from measles. About 48,000 were hospitalized and 4,000 suffered from encephalitis. 1954 was the year when uh, John Enders and Thomas Peebles um, took blood samples from, um, from s several uh, students um, who were uh, during a measles outbreak in a school in Boston. He was, uh, they were finally uh, successful in isolating measles virus from a 13-year-old kid named David Edmonston. 1958, uh, Sam Katz, he, he was an infectious disease specialist. He was working, um, he joined the, uh, Thomas Peebles group and other researchers in Boston lab and finally came up uh, with a um, vaccine which was first tested in mentally retarded and disabled children at a school outside Boston. Again, not an ideal way to do research. Um, there was an outbreak later in that school, and most of the kids uh, who got the vaccine did not, did not have measles. Um, however, the, the vaccine did have a lot of side effects, and um, uh, the researchers believed that they need to weaken the virus even more. 1963 was when John Enders and colleagues transformed their first uh, uh, Edmiston B strain of measles virus into a vaccine and was licensed uh, in the U.S., there was a killed vaccine which was given to uh, people from 1963 to 1967, but that was not uh, successful and was later withdrawn. In 1968, an improved and even weaker measles vaccine was developed by Morris Hillman and colleagues, and this is the vaccine that we still use to date, only vaccine that is licensed, that has been uh, licensed since then in U.S. 1978, measles vaccine was uh, combined with uh, mumps and rubella. 1978 was uh, the year when CDC declared a goal of eliminating measles from U.S. by 1982. This is um, a vaccine truck which was spotted and had the mes message on it, measles must go. Another uh, poster from CDC uh, to uh, promote vaccination in kids. And this is a worker working in uh, a lab in uh, Boston preparing a vaccine. So this is the graph uh, of measles from 1944 to 2007. If you look, this, this was the pre-vaccine era, uh, era, and uh, there were like hundreds, hundreds of thousands of cases every year. And this is when the vaccine was first licensed, 1963. There was an immediate drop um, as the uh, vaccination started, and uh, the, uh, it was less than 100,000 cases per year. And there was a small bump in cases around 1988. And this is when this is when there were um, um, this was mostly among kids who were not vaccinated. And then the uh, CDC came up with a guideline that uh, if you if you do a second dose at four to five years of age. It provides better immunity, and then the second dose was recommended, and since then, uh, the incidence has been pretty low. This, this, this was an un unfortunate event in history uh, of vaccines. This, this is a paper published in Lancet by Andrew Wakefield and, and his 12 colleagues. They had 12 children. They, they studied 12 children 
um, who had the chronic uh, enterocolitis and had some regressional, regressive developmental disorders. They did several tests on them. They did uh, um, endoscopy, biopsies, EEGs, lumbar puncture, and um, barium uh, follow through. They found that most of these kids had the had chronic lymphoid, uh, ileal lymphoid hyperplasia, um, and then most of these kids um, um, had some developmental regression, and they attributed the uh, measles, uh, the MMR vaccine for this. This, this led to um, a severe decline in uh, vaccination rate, mostly in UK. Uh, however, this uh, brought up a debate in US uh, with increasing incidence of autism during that period. In February 2004, Sunday Times, uh, a newspaper from uh, UK reported that uh, some of the parents of the 12 children that were there in the study were recruited by a UK lawyer who was preparing a lawsuit against the MMR manufacturers. The hospital where the research was done had received 55,000 pounds from the UK's legal aid board to pay for the research. And um, Wakefield was alleged to have uh, taken 400,000 pounds from uh, personally from uh, from the uh, lawyers, which he had not disclosed uh, when he submitted this article to Lancet. 2004, uh, Lancet was uh, quick uh, to with, uh, to retract the article. They said the, the financial disclosures were, disclosures were not made. Finally, in a hearing in uh, 28 Jan on 28 January 2010. Uh, the UK General Medical Council found the three dozen charges uh, on Wakefield, including four uh, counts of dishonesty, 12 counts in, involving abuse of developmentally challenged children, where he enrolled them and made them go through several procedures which were not required, including lumbar punctures and um, endoscopies and biopsies. Even though the study has been debunked, um, uh, most, most anti-vaccine activists uh, do not want to uh, look at that evidence, and they still continue to talk about against the vaccine. So in 2000, finally, US uh, declared that measles was eliminated. Um, uh, measles was eliminated from the country. And elimination is different from eradication. Eradication is where uh, there is no measles at all. Elimination is where you don't have, uh, you don't have uh, a transfer of uh, the organism within a geographical area. So you still, uh, you still see some cases, but most, uh, most, most years the cases were less than 100. And most of these cases were, were um, measles, which was uh, brought from foreign countries, uh, from India, um, Philippines, Europe, um, uh, to America, um, and mostly unvaccinated kids. But there are three years which saw big outbreaks. One was 2008, 2011, 2013, and 2014. So in 2008, there were several outbreaks, including three large outbreaks. 2011, uh, during the period of 2008 to 2011, there was a huge epidemic of measles going on in Europe. And uh, 2011 saw a big jump in uh, um, um, cases in in US and most most of them were brought from France 2013 had 11 outbreaks three of which had more than 20 cases and 2014 was the year you can see which had the largest number of cases uh, so it saw 23 measles outbreak one large outbreak of 383 cases uh, including uh, uh, occurring primarily among unvaccinated uh, Amish communities in Ohio. And many of these cases were brought in from Philippines. So even though uh, measles was eliminated uh, from US, you still had the threat of getting measles from um, other countries. And, and that's why it's important to maintain that herd immunity, vaccinate everyone, so that uh, it, it cannot spread easily. So this is this is a this is the latest outbreak that's going on. Uh, started in December 2014 um, uh, at Disney Disneyland. Unfortunately, it was at Disneyland, but it did bring a lot of media attention to it. 
you can see California was the state which was mostly affected and there were uh, 17 other states total 178 people uh, were affected Tennessee Tennessee didn't have any cases any reported cases of measles however Georgia did have uh, one to four cases so talking about this outbreak um, the measles virus which uh, was um, found in this outbreak was B3, was um, classified as B3, and this is very identical to the virus that caused the large measles outbreak in Philippines in 2014. Um, additionally, there have been um, uh, other, at least six other states which uh, had cases of B3 virus, and uh, among the 110 California patients, a large number of them, 45, were unvaccinated. 12 were too young to be vaccinated. 28 uh, had personal belief and one on alternative plan. So that's 45%, almost half of the people were unvaccinated that we know. And then a, a huge chunk, 43%, had unknown or undocumented vaccination status. status. Excuse me. So five had the one dose of five five had one dose of uh, measles containing vaccine and then seven had two doses, one had three doses and then one of them had the uh, immuno IgG uh, documented which means he might have got uh, either a, a prior vaccination or, or a measles infection in the past. The age, the age range was from six weeks to 70 years and the median age was 22 years. Among the 84 patients that uh, that we know of the hospitalization status, 17 were hospitalized. So 20%, almost one fifth of the patients were hospitalized. However, there, there were no deaths in US since 2000 uh, on measles. And this is, this is uh, something that, um, that um, people who do not want to vaccinate argue on that there have been uh, no deaths in US. Um, and um, uh, our, our medical, um, um, uh, capability is good enough to uh, tackle any kind of uh, measles. However, if you look at the world, there are still a lot of deaths uh, uh, caused due to measles, 145,700 <coughs> measles deaths in 2013. That's about 400 deaths every day, 16 deaths every, every hour. And that's a huge drop from uh, 2000. Uh, that's a 75 percent decrease. Uh, uh, from 2000 to 2013 worldwide, and it's all, it's all due to vaccination. In 2013, um, at about 84 uh, percent of the children received one dose of measles vaccine by their first birthday through routine health services, up from 73 percent uh, in 2000. So just with a 11 percent increase in, in, the, in the vaccination, you see a 75 percent drop in mortality. During 2000 to 2013, uh, it prevented at least 15.6 million deaths uh, in the world. Me measles vaccine is considered to be one of the best buys in public health. Um, the WHO estimates the cost for one shot to be one dollar, um, and and um, um, and you can see how much how much uh, decrease in mortality that has caused. And most people who don't get vaccines have, don't have access to uh, vaccines. So this, 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 I thought, was a good message that, you know, even if you have vaccines, you still refuse them. Etiology is caused by a rubella virus. It's a single-stranded single uh, enveloped RNA virus with uh, uh, one serotype. The genus is morbili virus. It's, uh, it belongs to Paramyxoviridae family, and humans are the only natural host for, uh, for the virus. And this is, this is a 3D image of the virus. Uh, it, it's so ugly that you, that's, that's one good reason to vaccinate. You don't want <laughs> an ugly virus like that in your blood, in your lungs, or anywhere. Transmission, it's one of the most contagious infectious agents known. Um, so if if no one was vaccinated, no one had immunity to uh, measles in this room, and I walked in with measles, 
ninety percent of you would um, have um, contact uh, would have would develop measles. It's uh, transmitted by direct contact with uh, infectious droplets or by airborne spread. Can remain infectious in air for up to two hours. Incubation period for symptoms is about six to nineteen days, and onset of rash generally occurs from seven to twenty-one days. It's contagious. Uh, four days before the rash starts and four days after the rash starts, and that's that's in um, in uh, in the immunocompetent people. In immunocompromised, uh, they can have prolonged excretion of virus, so um, they they are they can transmit the virus as long as they have the illness. Our patients with SSPE, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is a late complication of measles, um, and I'll talk about it later in my talk, they are not contagious. Clinical features, it starts uh, like any other viral illness with uh, fever. Generally, the fevers are very high, um, often greater than 104. Typically, lasts four to seven days. Um, the prodome phase also has malaise, fever, and anorexia, just, just like any other viral illness. Uh, you'll hear a lot about classic triad of conjunctivitis, cough, and coryza, the three Cs that you see in prodome. And before you get the classic rash, there is um, another characteristic enanthem called coplic spots. They appear two to four days after the onset of prodome and last three to five days. And this is, this is pathognomic for uh, measles. Um, however, um, um, it, it's, um, it's not very sensitive, so you might not see it in everyone uh, who has measles. They look like bluish gray specks or grains of salt on a red base, and I have pictures of it uh, later. And they appear on the buccal mucosa opposite to the second molar, typically. One to two days after you get the coplic spots, uh, you see the rash. Rash is mostly blanching, erythematous macules and papules. It starts on the face, at the hairline, moves to the neck, uh, then trunk, and then le legs. So it moves cephalocaudally, and then um, it moves in outward direction. Within 48 hours, uh, the, uh, the macules and papules, they coalesce into patches and plaques which spread cephalocaudally to the trunk and extremities including palms and slows. The lesion density is greatest above the shoulders and um, sometimes the eruption may be petechial or um, uh, echimotic in nature. The rash lasts from 5 to 7 days before they fade into a coppery, uh, coppery brown hyperpigmented patches. Uh, which they desquamate. And again, the rash may be absent in uh, people with uh, underlying uh, uh, deficiencies in cellular immunity. Some of the pictures which I got from Red Book, a uh, six-year-old female with uh, early facial rash and conjunctivitis. Generally, the conjunctivitis is non-purulent. It's uh, mostly watery eyes. Uh, another girl with uh, conjunctivitis, uh, results in clear tearing, you can have photophobia with it. These are uh, classic coplic spots. You can see uh, white white uh, granules of sand on an erythematous base. Another picture, more clear in this one, over here. Uh, this is a um, picture of a rash. Any any reference you pull up, you you see, you see this kid's picture. So um, I don't know, uh, he's he's there everywhere. And then uh, some other uh, pictures of the rash. It's the same kid with uh, rash on her back. It's another kid with a two-year-old with uh, a confluent rash of measles. Another picture of a rash. And this is just pharyngitis. These are not coplic spots. This is just pharyngitis that you can develop from measles. This is a picture. Um, you can see the rash was sloughed, and then it's a um, big area of open skin. And, um, and then uh, this, this, this should be treated uh, like a burn because it's, it's uh, open skin. And this is a picture of a Nigerian mother uh, and child. Uh, at a CDC camp where they were big during a war in Nigeria 
and there were big outbreaks of measles during that. Complications, most common complications are um, otitis media, bronchopneumonia, laryngotracheal bronchitis or croup or diarrhea. These are the most common complications that you see. Rarely uh, you can have acute encephalitis. One out of every thousand cases will develop uh, acute encephalitis and they can, uh, this can result in permanent brain damage. One or three out of every thousand children die from respiratory or neurological complications. Um, and then this is uh, subacute sclerosing pan encephalitis um, is, um, is, a delayed, is a delayed complication. It develops seven to 11 years after the measles infection. And it, uh, it, it is a uh, degenerative disorder. It starts as uh, behavioral and intellectual deterioration. Then they can have seizures. And then uh, they end up uh, in a chronic vegetative state. Uh, generally, the uh, death occurs in one to three years after this, uh, mm, this happens. There's no, no treatment um, uh, which has been well studied and for SSPE. Um, just because the cases are so rare. But however, people have used interferon and uh, ribavirin for treating SSPE. People who are high risk for complications, infants and children under uh, age of five years, adults over 20 years, pregnant women, uh, people with, um, uh, people who are immunocompromised for any reason, or severe malnutrition, there's a huge association between vitamin A deficiency and, uh, and uh, severity of measles infection. Um, the uh, pathogenesis is not exactly known. Uh, but uh, this has been well proven in several studies. Some of the pictures of the complications. This is a six-year-old kid who had ALL and then uh, developed measles and um, had measles pneumonia, eventually died of respiratory failure. Another kid uh, who had measles and cephalitis, you can see some demyelination over there. You can see uh, some swelling and hyperintensity in this region. Hemorrhagic uh, measles or black measles. This is a very, very rare complication of measles uh, where they have thrombocytopenia and they bleed, uh, bleed everywhere. Um, that uh, you can see his mucosa looks black and that's why it was called black measles. Um, and it can lead uh, bleeding from mouth, nose or, or the GI tract. Diagnosis. Um, IgM um, is, is, is the one which uh, most people use for diagnosis. Uh, the sensitivity of this test depends on the uh, time you got the specimen and depends on the immunization status of the case. So if, if, if the specimen was collected within 72 hours after the rash, uh, you can have up to 20% false negative, which is again a big false negative rate. If, if, the, if, if the symptoms are persistent, especially the rash is persistent for 72 hours, most people say to repeat an IgM level uh, to see if it's going up. And then um, in um, unimmunized uh, people, the IgM can be detected up to a month. And, and this test is more reliable in unimmunized people. It might be absent or present only trans transiently in people who are, who are immunized. Um, the other method is uh, uh, to um, look for measles RNA by uh, reverse transcripted, transcriptase PCR or uh, a viral um, isolation by culture. Uh, CDC recommends to do uh, both, uh, both IgM assay and, and uh, measles RNA uh, by PCR. Uh, samples you can get from throat nasal samples or nasopharyngeal swabs. Um, urine samples can be used. Ideally, you should collect samples from more than two sides or, or more than one side, so at least two sides. And you should collect um, the sample on first day of rash or whenever you see the patient and you suspect of measles. Um, virus can still be recovered by cell culture um, through day 10 following rash. However, it's, it's more sensitive when done during the first three days. 
in our measles RNA by PCR, it can be successful as late as 10 to 14 days. This is more for uh, surveillance and public health uh, um, kind of thing. So when you have a measles <coughs> outbreak and you suspect someone to have measles, you should send uh, specimens to CDC and they do a genotyping determination uh, to see where the measles uh, virus came from. Like the one in this, uh, in this outbreak, current outbreak was from Philippines. And then uh, they also do genomic sequencing to differentiate between a wild virus versus the virus which is in vaccine. Whenever you suspect a case of measles, even um, you have to report it immediately with, uh, uh, even though the diagnostic results are not back. Treatment is cheap. Google has treatment for everything. Um, I found this on Google. James Munian, he, he had, he, founded a Munyan homeopathic uh, home remedy and he treated measles just for 25 cents. Uh, however, it's, it's not proven scientifically. Uh, treatment is mostly supportive. Ribavirin is used um, uh, in, in, in certain cases. Uh, however, there have not been any controlled trials. It's not FDA approved. The measles virus is susceptible to it in vitro. So that's promising. Vitamin A, uh, WHO recommends um, all children with measles to have uh, vitamin A irrespective of their um, nutritional status. The research has shown that if you do two, um, two doses of vitamin A, um, you are most likely to get favorable outcomes or decreased uh, um, severity. A recommended dose is 200,000 international units for 12 months or older. Um, once daily for two days, 100,000 units for six months to 11 months, and 50,000 units for less than six months. A third, a third dose is recommended two to three, four weeks after uh, for children who have signs or symptoms of vitamin A deficiency. Isolation. Um, anyone suspected to have measles should be isolated um, for four days after the onset of rash because they are uh, they are contagious during that period if, if they are otherwise healthy. However, if they are immunocompromised, then they can shed the virus throughout the illness. You have to isolate them throughout the illness. Um, if, if a susceptible person who is unimmunized and does not have evidence of immunity against measles is exposed um, to measles, he should be isolated from 5 to 21 days um, after um, exposure. So what, what counts as evidence of immunity? There should be a written documentation of adequate vaccination, which is uh, one dose for preschool age children or uh, two doses for school age children, or uh, a laboratory evidence of immunity, or a laboratory confirmation of measles, or birth before 57 years, before 1957, sorry. Um, this, this is, uh, um, this is because before 1957, uh, measles was so prevalent, there were so many epidemics of measles that anyone who was born before measles, um, uh, before 1957 is considered to have been exposed to measles and uh, have developed uh, immunity. Uh, care of exposed people. So if someone is exposed to a person with measles, you can do either two things. You can either vaccinate them or give them immunoglobulins. A vaccination is um, um, ideal uh, if it is given within 72 hours of ex exposure um, in susceptible individuals unless they have a contraindication for vaccine. Um, this, this provides uh, protection or disease modification. Um, immunoglobulins, all susceptible, uh, any susceptible person who cannot receive vaccine should get uh, immunoglobulin within six days of exposure. Uh, you can give it IM or IV. IM is 0.25 ml per kilo or, um, or in um, immunocompromised uh, kids, it's, it's, the dose is higher, it's 0.5 ml per kilo. Max dose is 15 ml. IV dose is 400 milligrams per kilogram. 
and this is um, indicated for all susceptible households or or other close contacts. Kids younger than one year of age, pregnant women because pregnant women cannot get the vaccine, uh, immunocompromised people or other people in whom uh, measles vaccine is contra contraindicated, you can give them IgG immunoglobulins. Talking about the vaccine, um, as I said, it's a live attenuated strain prepared in chicken embryo cell culture. Um, the single measles vaccine is <coughs> not available in US, however, it is available in other parts of the world. Uh, you can either do an MMR, which is a combination of measles, mumps, and rubella, or MMRV, which is a combination of measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella. So if, if you get the first shot at uh, 12 months of age, 95% uh, will have uh, serum measles antibodies. If you get the first shot at 18 months or, or 15 months of age, 98% will have some serum measles antibodies. And greater than 99 um, after two doses of uh, a vaccine. So the failure rate is pretty low for this vaccine. Who should get vaccinated? Uh, who should get the vaccine? Almost everyone. Uh, children, so the vaccine recommendations for children, the, the first dose should be at 12 to 15 months of age. Ideally, you should you should vaccinate them at 12 months of age, uh, catch them as early as possible, and then repeat the second dose at four through six years of age. You can also give the second dose 28 days later from the first dose. <coughs> Students at uh, post high school educational institutions if they do not have an evidence of uh, measles immunity, uh, then they need two doses of MMR vaccine because um, that's, that's considered a high risk environment where you have contact with so many people um, and they should receive two doses. And the second dose should not be 20, uh, earlier than 28 days after the first dose. Adults, people who are born during or after 1957 and who do not have evidence of immunity against measles should be given at least uh, at least one dose of MMR vaccine. Um, the only exception to this um, is if, if they are born before 1957 um, and they are planning to be pregnant, then they need the vaccine, but I, I doubt they can be pregnant uh, at this point uh, because they, they still need the immunity uh, from rubella. Uh, that's according to CDC. That's not my thing. And um, and the other other people would be people working in he healthcare professionals. Um, uh, they should uh, also be um, have uh, an evidence of immunity other than just being born before 1957. International travel. So if if an infant um, between six to eleven months of age is uh, going abroad. Uh, you can give him one dose of MMR vaccine. You should give him one dose of MMR vaccine. If he's uh, 12 months or older, and if he has received his first month, a uh, first dose, then you can give the second dose 28 days after the first dose. And uh, teenager or adults who are born during or after 1957, uh, they should have documentation of two doses of MMR. So anyone who can receive two doses of uh, vaccine should get two doses of vaccine for international travel. And um, anyone who can uh, who is not eligible for the second dose, you should try to at least get the first dose, uh, especially for infants between 6 to uh, 11 months. The MMR vaccine is not approved before 6 months of age. And uh, generally, you have some, you have some uh, protection from uh, mom's antibodies against the measles. So that's why um, you don't um, need to vaccinate them. Healthcare personnel. They should have an evidence of immunity against measles. They should have documented uh, two doses of live virus vaccine. Um, it's not one dose, it's two dose. Or they should have laboratory evidence of uh, immunity, laboratory confirmation of disease and birth before 1957. Um, however, this, 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 this is an uh, exception in this case. Even though they're born before 1957, ideally they should have evidence of immunity. Adverse events from vaccine, not very common. Five to 15% can have fever. 
It generally occurs six to twelve days after the vaccine. The fever lasts for one to two days. It can last last as long as five days. It can have transient rashes in five percent of kids. However, um, during this fever or during the rash, these kids are not contagious. Uh, febrile seizures. There, uh, there is an increased incidence of febrile seizures. One in three thousand or four thousand people. Uh, generally occurs five to twelve days after the vaccine. They can have transient thrombocytopenia. It's very, very, very rare. One in twenty-two thousand to forty thousand. And um, so, people who are not immune to the uh, to to measles generally get these adverse adverse events. So, once they once they get the first shot, generally they don't get the second uh, don't get the same adverse events on on the second shot on the second dose. So, or or the incidence is substantially lower on the second dose. CNS conditions like encephalitis has been reported. It's it's very rare, less than one per million. But again, the incidence of encephalitis of unknown cause is um, much. Um, this incidence is much lower than encephalitis of unknown cause in this age group. Uh, so you don't know if 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 it was just a temporal event or or a causal event. It has never pre proven to be a causal event uh, in in uh, um, terms of encephalitis or encephalopathy. Seizure. Um, if if uh, there is a history of seizures or a first degree relative with seizure, they are at a slightly increased risk of um, having a seizure, um, and uh, you should uh, you should inform the uh, family uh, about the increased risk of seizure. Um, and the uh, recommendation is to vaccinate them with uh, MMR and varicella, and not use the MMR MMRV vaccine in this case. How soon is the seizure happens? Um, that I didn't I didn't find any information on how soon it happens. So, so precautions and contraindications for the vaccine: minor illness such as URI, go ahead and give them the shot. Fever is not a contraindication to immunization. The, um, but if they are seriously ill, they are ill appearing, um, looking like they are going to die, then probably you should not uh, um, vaccinate them at that point. Uh, wait till they recover. Allergy to eggs. Uh, this is a common question on boards. Um, um, it does not um, uh, do anything, even though the it's made in chicken embryo. Um, if they have allergy to eggs, you can go ahead and uh, give them the shot. Neomycin allergy, if it's non-anaphylactic, the recommendation is to go ahead and uh, give them the shot. Um, if, if they have severe hypersensitivity or uh, anaphylaxis to neomycin or gelatin, then avoid the immunization. Uh, you can. What you can do is you can probably test um, uh, test uh, if they developed any uh, immunity um, after the uh, first shot, uh, and then uh, if, if they they have developed um, decent amount of immunity, then you don't need to do the second shot. But if if they have not, then you can consider the option of going to an allergy immunologist and doing it in a controlled situation. Pregnant women should not get MMR vaccine, uh, and um, Women should avoid getting pregnant for four weeks after vaccination with MMR. So if, if they get uh, a, um, their first MMR vaccine before first birthday, in a case like um, they're an international travel or during a measles outbreak, that shot, that, that shot does not count uh, towards regular vaccination. And the reason uh, for that is uh, they still they still have um, antibodies uh, from mom up to one year of age, and that can interfere with uh, with the vaccine. Um, so you still consider them um, as uh, not immunized, and then uh, do both shots. Other precautions: thrombocytopenia. I said it was a very rare. Um, it, it was a very. Um, it is a very rare complication. There have been no reported case. Cases which have resulted in uh, hemorrhagic complications or death in otherwise healthy people. However, um, they say the uh, uh, you should assess the risks and benefits of the MMR vaccine before um, giving them the second shot. And, and again, you can do the same thing, uh, like um, uh, anaphylaxis situation. You can test them for immunity if if they have developed sufficient amount of immunity. You don't give the uh, you don't need to give them the second dose. 
um, if they receive any kind of immunoglobulin preparations or blood products, depending on the dose uh, of the uh, immunoglobulin or depending on what kind of blood product they got, you have to wait certain period of time before you can give the MMR shot. And there is a table in uh, Red Book, table 1.9. It has uh, the recommended in intervals for uh, um, to wait uh, between IgG and blood products and the vaccine. It was a huge table, so I, I don't think it would be beneficial to put it in the presentation. So tuberculosis, if anyone has confirmed TB, Go ahead and start the uh, anti-tuberculosis therapy before you give them the vaccine. PPD test, if, if you have to do PPD testing, if it is done on the same day, um, then it's fine. Uh, otherwise, if you have given the shot and you have not done the PPD test, then uh, wait till four to six weeks. Or it can interfere with the results of PPD. Immunocompromised patients with um, disorders associated with increased severity to viral infection, uh, they should not be given the MMR vaccine. Corticosteroids, if they're on high dose of corticosteroids, 2 milligram per kilogram or 20 milligram or greater than 20 milligram per day of prednisone or its equivalent for 14 days or more, then you wait at least a month before you uh, give them the shot. HIV infection and vaccine. This is this is interesting. So, MMR is uh, recommended for um, for people with a symptomatic HIV infection or people with symptomatic HIV infection who are not severely in, immunocompromised. And uh, however, if they are severely Im immunocompromised, then then you should not give them the uh, live measles vaccine. And they use two criteria to. Uh, uh, define severely immunocompromised. One is low CD4 counts, and the second one is percentage of total lymphocytes. For um, infants less than 12 months of age, if the CD4 count is less than 750, or uh, less than 15% um, um, as total lymphocytes, then they're considered severely immunocompromised. For one to, through, one to five years, it's less than 500 for CD4 and less than 15%. For six to 12 years, it's less than 200, less than 15 for um, greater than 13 years is less than 200 or less than 14. Ideally, an infectious disease specialist should be taking care of uh, them at this point. However, the household members of um, HIV infected person, they should receive the MMR. The virus is not shed after immunization, so uh, anyone with HIV is not at risk of um, getting um, infected from, uh, from a household member. And, and um, it is recommended because it does build up the herd immunity um, in this case. Outbreak control. Any case you suspect um, of measles, you should report immediately, um, even though it's just um, suspicion and uh, you don't have any confirmation. Obtain lab evidence. They say get it as soon as possible. Uh, don't wait for the rash to occur, just uh, get lab evidence uh, as soon as possible and you can repeat it if, um, um, if they come back negative and you still have high suspicion. During an outbreak, offer MMR vaccine to anyone who lacks evidence of immunity. And uh, if it involves preschool children uh, and they got one dose of uh, MMR and it's been more than 28 days, you, can, you, you should go ahead and give them the second dose during an outbreak. If the outbreak involves infants, you should immunize all um, from 6 to 11 months. And, and these, these are the new recommendations um, in the uh, updated recommendations in uh, Red Book um, after this recent um, outbreak. Uh, people who have uh, not been immunized uh, um, should be um, excluded. So if, if they are not immunized by personal choice or for any other reason, if they cannot get the shot, they should be excluded from school, child care, health care settings until at least 21 days after the onset of rash in the last case of measles in the community, which I think is, 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 is good in theory but uh, highly impractical. No measles parties. Um, go ahead and vaccinate. Um, the, the virus in vaccine is much safer. It's, it's much weaker than the real virus. So, um, 
I don't think we have measles parties here, but there were some rumors of measles parties in California. WHO and CDC and several other organizations have uh, vowed to eliminate measles by or before 2020. Um, there are several areas um, in the world which uh, still, which still um, are endemic to measles, and it, it's very important that we educate our patients to um, to um, uh, to be vaccinated and have the immunity against measles because again that herd immunity is what protects us from getting measles from um, countries um, outside of uh, U.S. Um, even though it has been eliminated from here. That's the end of my talk. Any questions? Is the largest gathering for people traveling abroad is in Saudi Arabia yearly. Mm -hmm. And is there a recommendation that everybody who goes, regardless 1957 or before, and before obviously, uh, need to be vaccinated for reason? Or just go to the CDC and find out? I, I, I think I, the CDC recommendation for the Hajj is only the meningococcal vaccine, Dr. Right. Yeah, There's not measles vaccine, but it's a good point. You know, there are so many people there. Should that become a requirement? Uh, is something to think about. As far as I know, the CDC recommendation is the meningococcal vaccine. And, and WHO has an interactive map. Uh, on which you can just click uh, on any part of the world and you can see um, see how much measles is there in that area and probably that would help if, if um, the CDC's recommendation is if you are traveling uh, to a place where um, uh, where there is endemic um, um, measles or you are just traveling then you have to have evidence of immunity. I think the problem becomes it's so, so infectious It's, it's just a regular immunoglobulin, the IVIG uh, that, that we use.